Good evening. I'm Kelly Wright. Thanks for joining me as we spend the next hour together. I am hoping that you're safe and well, taking care of yourself and your family because you matter. My opening observations tonight, not only do you matter, your vote matters. And today is a very important day. It's National Black Voter Day. Therefore, we want to talk about that and the importance of it in the top of this show, because exercising the right to vote is crucial to maintaining a fair democracy. It's also crucial that the black vote can impact state, national, and international policies with regard to how black Americans are viewed and what we do for our future. So make sure that you are registering to vote. Double check your registration. In addition to that, make sure that you go to vote either by absentee or mail in and do it early. And if you must go in for a personal showing to vote, but make sure you do that safely. And all politics being local, be sure you know what's going on in your neighborhood, in your community, in your city, in your state for knowing particular issues that are going on that will appear on the ballot, know how to vote according to your preference. The bottom line is you matter and your vote matters. And those are my opening observations. And your vote matters to the presidential candidates. Case in point, the Biden-Harris campaign has been conducting a turn up and turn out the vote virtual bus tour in North Carolina. Vice presidential nominee Kamala Harris talking about the issues that black Americans face in November. Thursday night, presidential nominee Joe Biden conducted a town hall in his birthplace of Scranton, Pennsylvania. There he talked about a number of issues facing all Americans and black Americans, including touching upon the subject of white privilege. Do you see ways that you've benefited from white privilege? Sure, I've benefited just because I don't have to go through what my black brothers and sisters have had to go through, number one. But number two, you know, grow up here in Scranton. We're used to guys who look down their nose at us. We look to people who look at us and think that we're suckers. Look at us and they think that we don't, we, we're not equivalent to them. On the Republican side, President Trump's campaign issued this statement by Paris Denard. President Trump has a winning record of achievement for the black community and has done far more to empower, uplift, and inspire the black community in just four years than Joe Biden has in 47. Meanwhile, President Trump on the campaign trail in a mostly maskless outdoor campaign rally in Wisconsin last night continued to state that a vaccine for COVID will happen soon. We're producing a vaccine in record time. This is a vaccine that we're going to have very soon, very, very soon by the end of the year, but much sooner than that, perhaps. But Olivia Troy, a former member of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, stated this against the president in her endorsement of Joe Biden. Towards the middle of February, we knew it wasn't a matter of if COVID would become a big pandemic here in the United States, it was a matter of one. But the president didn't want to hear that because his biggest concern was that we were in election year and how is this going to affect what he considered to be his record of success. The truth is he doesn't actually care about anyone else but himself. It's politics and it's presidential election time. We're coming back with Dr. Avis Jones DeWeaver to break it all down for us next. Joining me now to talk about all things politics, because there's a lot going on right now, is Dr. Avis Jones de Weaver. She's a political analyst and strategist. Good to see you. Avis, how have you been? I've been great. Wonderful to see you, too. Well, we're, we're seeing each other uh, after a lot of things going on in the campaign trail. Let's start with uh, Joe Biden. How did he do, in your opinion, last night with the town hall? Quite an unusual town hall, a drive-in or drive-through town hall. <laughs> Nevertheless, he was able to speak to the American people. Absolutely. It's like we've gone back maybe to the 50s, I guess, with the drive-in movies, and now it's a drive-in town hall. So <laughs> it was, it was very, it's a different venue, a different way, a way to be safe. But also, I think uh, we saw just such a stark contrast between a Joe Biden versus 
uh, a, a, um, a Donald Trump. Uh, his empathy was on full display. Uh, his ability to really relate to what people were going through was on full display. Also his different perspectives in terms of how he would handle, for example, uh, the COVID crisis uh, and a wide range of other issues that were brought up everything from white privilege, his stance on whether or not he believes he has white privilege to uh, you know, what, what's going on in, in the nation with regards to the economy. And so he really bought uh, his full self to bear in his old hometown. And he really made this contrast between the Scranton candidate versus the Park Avenue candidate. And if you ever had any, uh, any, any doubt in your mind as to how these two uh, gentlemen are different, I think last night really made it plain. Uh, this one is, is a diametrically opposed 180 de degree difference uh, from Donald Trump. And I think he really showed up really well and very powerfully in that town hall. And in showing up in that town hall, did he show the American people, particularly Black Americans, that uh, he is a candidate that people should eye very closely and seriously? Absolutely. I certainly believe that he did. I mean, uh, he really talked very specifically, not only about, for example, the question around, you know, do you have, do you believe you've experienced white privilege and unlike the current you know, president, he specifically uh, admitted that he had and, and, and saw the differential there. But he was also very specific in terms of how he would handle some things differently that I know uh, really impact uh, the Black community. He also talked about his record a little bit more from a different perspective than most people um, uh, really give acknowledgement to. For example, um, things that happened in the Obama-Biden uh, administration with regards to significantly reducing the crack cocaine versus uh, powder cocaine, sentencing disparities, uh, the fact that the actual, uh, you know, he, over, I believe he said that over 35,000 people were released uh, from federal prisons uh, under his administration, uh, which is a stark contrast from the direction that we're going in, in this administration. Uh, and so he was talking about that, uh, as well as addressing how health issues, which we know disproportionately impact African Americans, uh, how he would sort of approach uh, these diff issues differently. And finally, I would argue that he made a strong case towards uh, improving wages, moving towards a living wage for folks, uh, which I know is extremely important to the Black community. So I think he hit on a lot of issues uh, that matter to us. I uh, would love to see him on a specific uh, Black uh, the town hall that specifically focused only on Black issues. But in terms of uh, the issues that he addressed there, I really think that he hit a note that made a very strong, strong contrast uh, as regards to why people should vote for him versus merely voting against a Donald Trump. Yeah, and one of the things he did say is that he wants to be considered or seen as not a, a Democrat president, but a president for uh, the American people. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought it was good of him to talk about that because mm -hmm. on the other side, you have President Donald Trump pointing and finger pointing uh, and accusing Democratic leaders uh, in Democrat cities and states as being the culprit for violence, unrest, and, and even going so far as to try to suggest that uh, the Democrat states are leading in the number of coronavirus cases. Right. I mean, it, it's so ridiculous uh, to see how he approaches this job. I mean, he has no idea what the presidency is all about, but he's been like this from the very beginning. He only cares about his small subset of largely white and significantly and disproportionately white supremacist base. And so while he's doing things exactly as you mentioned, uh, talking about how, you know, well, if you took the blue states out, we'd have, less people would be dead. Well, I thought he was president of the entire America, the all states, not supposed red states and blue states. And we also know from previous reporting uh, that early on in this crisis, a decision was made not to address the issue that aggressively, specifically because they felt like blue states would be um, most significantly hurt by the pandemic. And so in essence, he's saying that he was willing to let Americans die because they lived in a state that he didn't carry in the in the past election. I mean, that is, you know, how do you get any more traitorous and evil than that? And so, you know, he, he, he has shown from the beginning who he is. Uh, and now it's time for us to make sure that he doesn't get four more years to do even more damage. 
Uh, I'm, I'm talking to Dr. Avis Jones Weaver. When we return, I'd like to continue our dialogue about what's happening on the campaign trail and what both of these men are doing. Uh, when I speak, speak men, I'm saying presidential candidates, the, the current president, and of course, the, the challenger, former Vice President Joe Biden. Back with more of Dr. Avis Jones Weaver right after this. So welcome back to the program. I'm talking to Dr. Avis Jones uh, De Weaver, political strategist and analyst and commentator. And we are talking about uh, the politics of what's going on. And of course, many people are looking at Donald Trump. And you, you were talking about Joe Biden uh, in his performance last night. If you had to grade him on, a, on an A, B, C, D scale in terms of last night's performance and what he uh, unveiled to the American people, what, what grade would you give him? Give him a B. Uh, I think that he rolled out some new messaging last night that I would love to see him hammer home even more. He made the contrast between uh, being a, a Scranton man versus a Park Avenue man. He needed to really sort of lean into that more. He talks about the contrast of having grown up uh, in a community where he's had to sort of, you know, this working class community where he's actually had to work for everything that he's acquired versus running against someone who inherited everything that he acquired and then still squandered it it all for the most part, you know? And so I think he needs to sort of lean into that difference between the two um, because somehow Trump has sort of created this persona that he's this grand populist who's for the people and he's never, he never has been. And, you know, obviously everything that we are seeing in terms of how he acts shows it. Uh, but I think that that's great messaging uh, for Biden to continue to lean into moving forward. I would also love him though, to be even more specific with his policies. Uh, if you go to his uh, website and read his policy platform, he has a lot of great policies that I think a lot of people on the left would be happy to see. Um, but I believe that, you know, even last night when he was sort of laying out some issues, he didn't delve as deeply and specifically into it as I would like. He would sort of refer people to his website. I'm not saying he needs to recite it all because there's a lot, right? Right. But, you know, be, be able to sort of point out some of the wonderful things that are in his platform that I think people would care about, uh, like, like, for example, pushing for uh, a living wage, like, for example, uh, the millions of dollars that you are proposing to be able to target to Black communities to lift Black businesses. I think there are lots of things in his platform uh, that would be good for people if more people knew about it. And in this day and age, you have to tell people. Don't just expect them to just go to your website and read it. You have to specifically not only articulate it, but articulate it over and over and over again. Repetition is how people will learn what he brings to the table. Well, that's a good point. Both men will be in Minnesota today. President Trump will be there. Uh, uh, Joe Biden will be there, uh, uh, you know, albeit they, they won't meet. Uh, but the point is, uh, you're, you're right. Uh, the, the, do you think the Democratic uh, Party is doing enough to promote the campaign of Joe Biden? Because if you look on the, on the other side of the spectrum, uh, Donald Trump is promoting Donald Trump. Yes. And he is... Uh, you, you don't even hear much about the Republican Party. You hear right. more about Donald Trump and his assertions towards his own scientists about handling coronavirus, about a vaccine, uh, about being the greatest president for African-Americans since Abraham Lincoln. Uh, no matter how you look at it, the president of the United States is still using his, uh, his style of campaigning mm -hmm. and getting a lot of information out there, whether people like it or not, he's still being very disruptive uh, and, and, and letting people know where he stands. Do you think Joe Biden not taking the same posture as a Donald Trump, but do you think Joe Biden needs to uh, counterattack that more vociferously if he intends to get to the Oval Office? I certainly do. I mean, to me, the Democrats have always legged behind uh, the Republicans uh, when it comes to messaging and just being able to sort of close the sale with voters 
in terms of how they communicate and their communication style. Uh, I am an entrepreneur, so I'm not going to say this to disparage anyone who sells things for a living, but for, for because I do that myself too, and I think it is important to do that. Uh, but I will say that uh, to me, the, the direction that Trump is going, he just seems like the most desperate and horrible of stereotypes of a used car salesman. I mean, he is just throwing everything against the wall. 90% of it is either a vast exaggeration, underestimation, or complete outright and out lie. Um, but he, what he does understand about sales and about marketing is that you have to maintain your messaging. You have to just sort of, you know, have messaging out there that is many, many, many times over because that's how people sort of learn things. That's how the human brain learns. It learns through repetition. So if you say the same thing often enough, there are people who will come to believe it, even if it's completely untrue. Um, just that very basic lesson around how to message and how to get people to absorb messaging and remember who you are and what you stand for uh, is a sort of one-on-one -on -one sales lesson that I love the Democrats to sort of take advantage of. Yeah. And, you know, we're down to 46 days. Uh, the, the tale of two candidates, two different men entirely. Uh, I want to talk to you real quickly before, uh, before I go. Uh, this past week, I had the pleasure of interviewing a number of uh, prominent African-American women uh, among them, Jackie Clark of the Clark sisters, uh, Martha Reeves, uh, as well as uh, uh, some, some people who are leading the AARP. And they had a conversation that counts about sisters getting together in Michigan, a pivotal state, as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they talked about the importance of Black women understanding their role uh, with regard to this election as well as this nation. And of course, you are also an author of uh, exceptional Black women. Um, how important is the, the vote among Black women? Absolutely critical. Uh, the Black woman's vote is in many ways the foundational element, not only of the Black vote, but of the whole entire Democratic Party. I mean, we show out uh, in uh, proportions that typically are disproportionate for, to our uh, representation in the population in terms of our turnout rate. And so we show up and show out even when others do not. Uh, and that is why our vote is so critical. And that's one of the reasons why it was so important for uh, a Joe Biden to, to acknowledge that by having a Black woman on the ticket with him. Uh, you know, the truth of the matter is he wouldn't even be the nominee let's just be real, if it wasn't for Black people in South Carolina, sure. disproportionately Black women. And uh, so he needs to understand uh, that we are a powerful element. Uh, I think he made a great vice presidential election, but I think he would, you know, he does well to continue to make sure that she is out there, plus he is out there, uh, not only speaking generally to issues that everyone cares about, but speaking specifically about issues that Black women uh, care about, just to make sure that we shore up our polls, our, our, our percentage of the, uh, of the electorate on election day, as well as bring those around us with us to the polls uh, to help to make sure that he is carried into victory. Well, as always, uh, Dr. Avis Jones DeWeaver, we thank you for your insights and uh, looking at uh, the candidates and we'll obviously be doing this again uh, between now and election day. Oh my, a lot going on. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks for be being part of us today. We'll be back with more after this. And welcome back to the program. Joining me now is Dr. Michelle Hancock, and she, here, she is here to talk to me about Black History 365 curriculum, which is an exciting plan to help all Americans understand the accomplishments and contributions of Black Americans. And, and Dr. Hancock, welcome to the program. You are uh, at the Education Department there at Carthage uh, College in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And, and this program that you've embarked upon beyond the college to help get 365 education about black history is so important. Thank you for doing it. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate this time with you. Tell me about the program. We, we had uh, the authors of the book 
a couple of weeks ago, and they had explained that it was already uh, operational and, and functioning in uh, Dallas, Texas. Yes, correct. And really what the curriculum description is really all about is a K-12 curriculum that provides a comprehensive review of Black history, and it is designed to fill the gaps that are left from our standard history books. Because as you know, Kelly, uh, we've all been in school, we've had U.S. history courses, and there is a lot that is left out and a lot that is whitewashed in our history books. And so BH365, the team, which was over 40 educators uh, from across the country, we have all worked diligently to bring to the surface what all students need to know and understand about Black Americans in America. It's so important now. It's, it's always been important, but it's more important now, given the racial climate that we're uh, that we find ourselves in. And, and of course, you're there in Kenosha, where uh, there's a lot of racial tension following the the, the shooting of uh, Jacob Blake, who is still paralyzed from those seven shots in the back by a police officer. If, if our public is more educated about the contributions and accomplishments of Black Americans. Might that uh, change some of the distrust that we have between Blacks and whites? I absolutely believe that is the case. We have to think about that. People, we have our implicit biases, right? Everyone has them. But one of the ways, there are multiple ways in which we can improve and understand implicit bias. And one of those ways is exposure to different cultures and the contributions that these cultures bring. And so one of the things that BH365 through our PD, we are looking at the textbook as not just a textbook, Kelly. It is really creating a culture. It's creating a mind shift in our educators to understand what it means to be culturally competent and to have cultural humility in terms of teaching about this text. Well, what do you think is the most fundamental thing that people can learn by studying uh, and having these textbooks, uh, BH365? I think one of the most important things that um, all people can learn by looking and reading in our book and engaging with the, the book is this, a deep respect for someone else's culture and the contributions they bring, but also helping you have a, own, a deep respect for your own culture. You know, one of the things, Kelly, I've been a PD national trainer for, uh, for over 10 years, really. And what I've learned in giving, uh, providing workshops to people, especially white people, they will say, oftentimes, I don't have a culture. When I ask them about culture, they talk about nationalism. They talk about their nationality. And so I take them through the rings of culture. When I talk about age, orientation, youth culture, all these different cultures, and I bring them back to understand that you have to understand that all of us have a culture and that in order to respect everyone's culture, you have to be knowledgeable about it. You have to be willing and wanting to learn and expose yourself to someone else's worldview. I want you to stay with me for another segment. When we come back from the break, I'd like to tell you, I'd like to ask you rather where that worldview about Black History 365 curriculum in America, how will it help our worldview uh, as in terms of appreciating uh, people appreciating Black America? Back in just a moment. And welcome back to the program. I'm talking to Dr. Michelle Hancock, and we are talking about Black History 365. She is a professor at uh, Carthage uh, uh, College there in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And we were talking about the fact that Black History 365 is a curriculum that's now being taught in Dallas and Texas. And, and is it happening across the country yet? Uh, it's not quite happening across the country, but we are expanding. And in the role of expansion, uh, are people who sit down for this curriculum, 
as well as teachers, parents, students themselves, are they thereby expanding their minds and their understanding of the significance of Black Americans living in America? Absolutely. We provide, the key component of the curriculum is to provide this robust professional learning experiences, okay? And when we do that, we are concentrating on moving people from uh, being learning oriented to being having the will to have the action. So when I think about teaching uh, this textbook and what it would entail for parents, for teachers, for anyone who engages in it, we have to really think about the being learning oriented and action oriented. So our, our PD literally talks about and engages people in the skill and the will. Do you have the skill, the learning oriented mindset, and do you have the action oriented mindset? And you can't have one without the other, Kelly. What literally has to happen is that people who engage with BH365 and our PD, we are helping them build their knowledge and build that knowledge where they are readers and reading literature and information, not just in our textbook, because our textbook literally is totally interactive. We have over 1,400, I believe, QR codes in that book. We are connecting youth and people, all people in society to all the different information that typically people have not been aware of. So we want them to be readers. We want people to be researchers. We want them to be active listeners. But we also, in build, building this cultural competence, we also truly want them to be culturally relevant and responsive in their thinking. And that culturally relevance is really understanding the social political the co critical consciousness of how we have been taught history in the past and what we need to do today in order to affect change throughout our society. So our knowledge outcomes, when we think about competence, Kelly, we are really talking about, look, understanding diverse cultural lens. We are really talking about racial consciousness. We are really talking about equity literacy. How do you recognize and redress the power imbalances that exist in our society today? That's why I say BH365 is so much more than a textbook. It is about a culture movement. And so when we move from that knowledge, then we want people to think of advocacy. We want them to think of action and what that looks, looks like. And that really gets to adjusting your beliefs, your mindset around having a deep respect for other cultures. Mm. It's really about having an empathetic, not a sympathetic attitude, but an empathetic attitude. And being a lifelong learner, what does that look like? Being equity-minded in your teaching, in your leadership, in your social engagement with others. So we can do that. So we're looking at changing behavior outcomes with people who work in the field of education and beyond. So what that looks like is the intercultural communication, the advocacy, the facilitation skills, transforming our teaching and learning where we truly just move beyond appreciation to really rethinking how we educate in this country. Stay with me. One more uh, break and we'll come back and talk about that transformation by the renewing of one's mind and opening it up so that people can learn and understand uh, the complexities, the wonderful complexities of Black life in America. Back with more after this. And welcome back to the program. I'm with Dr. Michelle Hancock, who is a, a professor uh, at Carthage College. She is in the education department, and she is also engaged, actively engaged in the Black History 365 curriculum. And it's a, a phenomenal program. And Dr., you were talking about uh, the, the transformative aspects of this kind of education and the innovation that's been applied to it. I think one of the most wonderful, brilliant, 
concepts out of this uh, BH365 curriculum is the fact that it uses technology, uh, that people can actually look at what's happening in history and history comes alive and they look at history taking place today you're talking about current issues and looking back to the past and making sense of the present so that we can pave a way for the future. And you've got to understand black America and its contributions in, in order to, to achieve that. Right. And so one of the things about BH 360, three, I'm sorry, BH 365 is that we have eight distinctives that are really unique to our curriculum. And I want to speak to that because that's Part of the, that is a major focus of how we move people from point A to point B, from being learning oriented, the skill to the will to action. Okay? okay, and so those eight distinctives are, you know, BH 365. We have exclusive access to over three thousand genuine documents and artifacts uh, from from uh, the Freeman Institute of black history, oldest collection, some of it dates back to 1553. I have looked at some of this collect, uh, uh, collection and I am just in awe. I didn't realize I've been on this earth, I'm not gonna talk about how many decades, okay? <laughs> but, but the reality is I went through school and there was so much I didn't know, so much I didn't learn and I thought I did. I have gone all the way to earn my doctorate and when I started working on this project with Joel and Walter, I was just blown away by the amount of information that is helping me to shift my mindset to help me open up and understand deeply about uh, Black Americans and their contributions to our overall society and the world. So that's one aspect of it. Another piece of it is the elephant experience. Uh, we have designed this elephant experience to engage people and our students, especially in this process, where they are looking at important subject matter that intersects from the past into today. And so that helps prepare any of us to become better critical thinkers, compassionate listeners, and is significant to what's going on in our country today. We also, our curriculum is missional. You know, a lot of the textbooks are transactional, Kelly. Yeah. Our book is about uh, Black-owned, Black proprietary uh, publishing of this book. That's, it's missional for us. It, there are over 40 of us involved in this. And I have met phenomenal educators, uh, you know, doctors, lawyers, different people who have been involved in this book, uh, Dr. Andrew Young, uh, Kathy Hughes, people who are on our advisory board. They are all part of this process in helping us put this message out there, put out a book that is more than a book. And I keep saying that, but it's so yeah. important. It's, it's not just a textbook. Wonderful. Dr. Michelle Hancock uh, there in Kenosha at Carthage uh, College. Uh, before I let you go, how's the atmosphere in Kenosha, Wisconsin, in, in the wake of uh, uh, protest and uh, death and the, the, the police shooting of Jacob Blake? How's his family doing? How are the people in Kenosha doing? I, I believe that uh, it's been difficult. I will say it's been difficult. I feel that it's been definitely difficult for Black Americans who live in Kenosha. I think it's been difficult for white Americans who live in Kenosha. Uh, we have to confront what racism, the legacy of race and racism in our country. And so Kenosha is just a microcosm of what we have witnessed and seen throughout this country for 400 years plus. You know, when I think of Sandy Bland, when I think of George Floyd, when I think of Jacob Blake, I believe all of us here in Kenosha needs to reckon with our own belief systems about humanity and what we believe humanity is and what it should ex how it should exist. What are the access and opportunities? So Kenosha must go on a journey just like the entire country. And we have to make a choice right now. We literally have to make a choice in saying that, do we believe that uh, 
all lives really matter. And you can't have all lives matter until you recognize that black lives matter. Mm -hmm. So Kenosha, I believe, is going to be doing a lot of self-examination and challenging our current system in turn in ways that they've never challenged before. Well, make sure that book is front and center in the curriculum, BH365. Like and, that, and that's my goal for Wisconsin, to bring this book and for you know, every state or, or the world. This book, which is a culture, we're yeah. gonna move it. We have to, we must. Yeah, it clearly shows, and uh, you've clearly stated uh, that we are all interconnected and interrelated, and it's about time we actually start appreciating that. It's a rich uh, aspect of American life. Uh, so thank you so much for being on the program. I appreciate you, and much success to you and the authors, uh, Joel Freeman and Walter Milton, who wrote uh, Black History 365. It is an exhaustive study of, uh, of history. Uh, in terms of uh, the Black American experience and the African diaspora included. So thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great weekend. You too. We'll nice with... meeting you, Kelly. Thank you You're... for having me. Thank you. Thank you. We're coming back with more after this. So welcome back to the program. It, uh, I have great delight in introducing to you Christine Bond. She is with an organization uh, that is going to D.C. Uh, all this weekend. And unlike the protests that we've seen for various groups, uh, peaceful protests and then some not so peaceful protests where they've been downright violent, this is not a protest that's going on. This is a rally that will be taking place tomorrow in Washington. It's called Jesus Reigns. And Christine, you represent this organization. Uh, we, I, my understanding is that this is a global organization that began in the Philippines. Why come to Washington at a time such as this in the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic and the racial unrest and the social justice issues that are going on in this country? Well, we actually had a plan already back in last year of 2019 to come into uh, the United States. So we started off by doing a soft launch in Hawaii and um, we were looking for state coordinators to represent. So they did a major vision casting to go through many states over a short period of time. And in the midst of that, then COVID hit. So in March, I took on the responsibility to uh, be the national core head for communications and prayer. Uh, and then also for the DMV area being the state coordinator. So this has been in the mix for a while. And the timing is perfect because uh, for you know, the holiday here, Rosh Hashanah, September 19th, and in the midst of everything else that's going on, this is a perfect opportunity to share the good news. Yeah, and you're right there on the mall in Washington. I can see the Capitol over your shoulder. And so this organization uh, will be having the, or the, the Jesus Reigns event tomorrow, as I understand. How long will it go on in the day? And, and do you expect people, how many people do you expect to attend? You know, it's been really interesting. Uh, when we started planning this, we were having a very difficult time getting permits. And um, not until about four weeks did the doors just open. And so we know that it's nothing short of the hand of God saying, this is something that he wants to have happen. We've been censored by social media platforms. So every time we put the event out, it comes down. Uh, but we're moving forward. And so we're gonna be hosting the event, the day of celebration on the Capitol from three to six tomorrow. And it'll be a day that the family can come out, put their blankets out, bring their family and just have a wholesome time to celebrate. We wanna bring some unity in the community. We wanna bring the walls of the church down. And because we're out in the tent, we can practice some of those social distancing protocol that we have to do, but we can still worship together in corporate worship. Yeah, and, and for people who are, are not of uh, the faith, I'm sure they'll be walking by and be curious to see a lot of people coming together peacefully and just uh, giving God some praise and praying for their nation. Uh, that's, that's a good thing. I, I'm delighted to have you on the program and uh, wanted to let people know that that goes on because you know faith is one of the most important uh, uh, elements in American life and in all uh, countries, but yet it's the most underreported. And that should not be the case at all. Absolutely. 
Well, so we're Christine, excited. We're excited. So thanks for having us. Christine Bond, I appreciate you for uh, bringing this to light and, and uh, talking to us about Jesus Reigns. Uh, before I let you go, I understand there's another group that's also uh, going to be there with you. Uh, it's Africa Praise for America. Is that right? Well, the organization is called Joshua Generation, and they have a unit which is Africa Bless America. So it's a group of diaspora in particular that are coming to uh, this area. They had planned again, just like we were, for a whole year. And they were going to bring about 1,500 to 2,000 intercessors from around different countries in Africa to repent for the slave trade. And a lot of us, unfortunately, as African Americans don't understand. And so they want to repent. They want to bless America in order to just come to a wholeness and a healing for not only our nation, but also for Africa. Christine Bond of Jesus Reigns, and I appreciate your, uh, your, your insights in providing that information for us. Thank you so much and have a blessed weekend. And you as well. Thank you. And I look forward to you participating with us. So come on out and join you got us. It. You Take got care. It. All right. Thanks, Christine. We're Thank coming you. back with more after this. And welcome back. I want to thank all of the guests who appeared on tonight's program. And I especially would like to thank each and every one of you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to watch. I appreciate you. My final word is vote. Get out and vote. And understand that the power of your vote is based on the sacrifices that our forefathers made. So do the right thing. Vote. And be righted, ignited, and united to keep spreading love, freedom, and peace. Good night. Have a great weekend. Let me break it down for you like The rhythm of love is easy to find if you're listening. The color of light isn't red, black, or white, but it's crimson. We all bleed the same. If you don't feel the groove, it's all right. Just give it time, give it time. Come on, y'all. Get on board. Mankind won't survive if our hearts beat inside a hateful rhythm. You see, love is important. But comes with a price of forgiveness, and we all bleed the same. Yeah. If you don't feel it now, just wait. It's coming on the love train. Just give it time, give it time. Get on board. That means you. And you and you, on the love train, get on board. All creeds and clouds, brothers, all sisters and brothers, and sisters, on the love train, get on board the love train. Everyone's invited.